Well, hello, hello to all of you. Um, this is Maureen Kelleher. I'm delighted to be back here in this room. We've been gathering here since 2015 for conversation and for performance. And so many of you who are watching us tonight have been with us on all of those previous years. And thank you for all of your kind messages. Thank you for your support. And we miss you. And we hope to see you again here very soon. And I've invited another Limerick man from Dublin via Limerick of 14 years to join me. Um, if I had known exactly what Dirt was going to say, Stephen, I could have called this a view from a hilltop in Nochfurna, but I called it view from a rock. And the year that we've just lived through, this sense here of living on this island nation in the East Atlantic, we've traditionally looked east and we've looked west. And apart from all of the other change that envelops our world right now, the model on which we as this island nation have made our way in the world looks very different now as we look east and west. So over the next half an hour, what I was hoping that you and I would chat about is from another man in Limerick, as you look out from a hilltop in Nochfirina, what does that new, what does that world look like to you? Stuff that was already underway pre-COVID and maybe accelerated or stuff that is new post the year that we've had. And what does it mean for us here living in this Atlantic rock? So, um, so what's going on? What's going on? Okay. Um, well, I, I guess the first thing is, uh, I didn't realize how affected I was going to be by that performance. I'm really like, I was kind of thinking about what I was going to say to you you know, economics and politics. And I've just that. narrowed the dimensions of time. No, 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 so you kind of exploded them. <laughs> you know, and I, I've forgotten, I think I've forgotten a little bit of what it's like to hear that, that kind of artistry. So just th thank you very much for inviting me. That was, that was amazing. Um, these talks are amazing. Um, and so thank you. Um, what, what I, when I look out, a, a large part of my job is, or the job that I've just decided to do, I take being an academic is you just what you actually get is the privilege to do whatever you want. No one tells you. You have to figure it out yourself. And so I just decided this is what I, what I care about is the really big picture. Not as big as that picture. That was a really big picture. That was thousands of years. And really deep artistry. No, when, when I look around, what I'm surprised by, shocked by, somewhat actually angered by, is how we tend to amplify the minutiae. You know, this guy's tweet you know, that, that lady's Instagram, this kind of stuff. And the tectonic plates on which our society and our economy are built, and, and, and just to be clear, it's a society first and the economy comes afterwards. The economy is really just about exchange to improve living standards. If you don't have a society, it's not much of an economy, you know? And I think what we realized actually through COVID is COVID forced the society part of us to shrink in certain respects on the economy part, but then other societal parts grew. And so you saw, for example, the fantastic work that OnPost did. OnPost is really just infrastructure for the community. You know, that's really what it is. We talk about letters, but that's not really what it is. So when I think about the, the future, I think about these large tectonic plates changing. For example, um, about two weeks ago, something called the Regional, Competitive, uh, uh, Re Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership was formed. Uh, this thing covers 2.2 billion humans. It's responsible for 30% 30, 30 of all uh, economic output in the world. This is the, the largest uh, uh, free trade agreement uh, in, in history. It received precisely one uh, a report in one newspaper that was copied and pasted from Reuters. This is going, that, that, just that one shift alone is in going to Irish change press. In the Irish press. It just didn't feature. This is, part of this is because trade deals are long and complicated yeah. and boring. But the, the reality of the situation, Mern, is that that kind of thing, and there was an African Free Trade um, uh, Association, almost comparable to the EU, that was signed last week. These things are changing around us. And if we're not very, very careful, we're going to be positioned in the wrong way. Right now, exactly as you said, we're looking at the United States, whose decline is, has been you know, foreshadowed for about 70 years now. 
It's not going to decline as quickly as we think. But the, the, the problem about decline versus, versus particular rising up uh, in, in countries is that it's all relative. Like you can be going at 20 miles an hour. Yeah. Somebody else is going at 50 miles an hour. Your, your speed is, your absolute speed is not important. It's the relative speed. So you have the Asian countries that are really rising up. And then Ireland is in this very strange place. Our economic model for the last 50 years, 60 years, has been based on the idea that we go out to the world and we say, hi, we're here. We're really smart. We all speak English. You know, we're, we're well educated and we're a conduit to this giant economic zone over here and we're great mates with those people over there. So just, you know, use us. And that, that verb is very important. Use us. And I think one of the things that the last two talks have kind of reminded me about is, uh, if anything, the, 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 the Celtic Tiger period, which is, I, 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 I kind of grew up in the late 90s and, and that, that period, was characterized by lots and lots of confidence. And the, I, I then went, went away to study in America and I came back and then every, it wasn't confidence, it was hubris. Everyone was like, we're amazing. We sell bits of the country to each other, we're awesome. And that all went away. What's been surprising about COVID is that we haven't lost the confidence. We're actually still able to do it. But to, to answer your question much more directly, we cannot rely on the old connections. The, the legacy connections that have created, if you like, enormous amounts of wealth, perhaps some, some of it for us, but a lot for others. Those legacy connections are tenuous. And I know this because I live in Limerick. And I know what it feels like when a large multinational pulls out. You've 1,900 jobs devastated. Uh, families uh, 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 forced to emigrate. 4,000 jobs indirectly lost. Now, that company is back, they're, they're hiring more people, they're doing great, but it, it was a salutary lesson to me that what is here is not here forever unless it's from here, unless it's of here. And I, I was very struck by the last two, two, uh, two talks, I suppose, about that there's a confidence in, in, in ourselves and in the past that I don't think our policies often reflect. And I, I'm, we often talk about this, oh, we should invest in indigenous industries. We, we do. But if you think about export-led growth, there's this idea that, you know, come, yeah. use us, we're very smart, we'll gain from the bargain. That, uh, that, that logic is, it, it works when everything is expanding. When globalization, which is the increased interconnection of markets for goods and services and ideas and people, when, when that is growing and there are more interconnections, any, the bet that we've made as a country on openness is a great bet. Because even if you're bad at it, you do well. We're not bad at it. We're amazing at it. We're world class, actually. Um, uh, one of the things I went back and had a look at today, I went back and I looked at uh, the IDA's uh, annual reports uh, for the last couple of years. The amount of uh, jobs that this uh, one agency has brought in is absolutely phenomenal. And these are real jobs. They pay real taxes. Your taxes pay for the hospitals. They pay for the, the doctors and the nurses that are looking after us, right? So it's, it, 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 I'm not discounting the benefits that they bring. Uh, very often when I'm writing, what I want to make people aware of are the risks and the costs. And if you, if, you, if you look always at the upside risks, when the downside comes, when all those thousands of jobs leave, you're devastated because it, it's a bit like, you know, a relationship has ended. You're like, oh, wait, you're breaking up with me, you know? And it, it feels like that. Um, so we have these very large blocks that are forming around us. The stock in Ireland of foreign direct investments. Very difficult, tricky thing to measure. Maybe just if we add, before we come to the Irish perspective in sure. that, Stephen, like, so we have a changing geopolitics. As we you do. say, we have new trade blocks. We have a rise of a China that is making itself known on the world stage mm. at a, and making commitments in the carbon sphere and, you know, having a level of influence that we haven't seen to date. Um... If you move to like you as a professional economist, like so if you come through like economically now, you've presumably lived through the biggest laboratory experiment. We froze economies. Mm -hmm. We found magic money trees. We uh, have an era of big government, of unprecedented debt coming back in. So if you look at that backdrop, and against the need for a huge mobilization of resources, against the 
existential threat against which COVID looks small of, of carbon transition. Economically, when you put those new economics, arguably with a different ideological backdrop mm -hmm. against a changed geopolitics, how do those two play against the technology changes which are a key part of the driving of some of that and then what we're living through culturally and politically? All of this takes place through infrastructure. Infrastructure is where we do the future yeah. in Ireland. We don't do the future. We have loads of plans about things, but we never do anything about it. Um, uh, we, we actually, we don't even have an AI strategy. There, you know, this, is, this thing is transforming global economies and societies. We really don't even have a strategy yet. It won't be out until the middle of next year. When, when we look at, um, when we look at the large scale changes, like the really big ones, um, I'm often struck by the fact that our, our approach tends to be, what can we get in this moment? It's very short term. So you, you mentioned, for example, uh, uh, COVID crisis, and then you know, we've got Brexit, and then we've got the climate crisis. They take place at different, um, they differ, they, they take place at different uh, decadal sort of cadences. And I, I often think that if we don't solve the immediate problems using infrastructure, uh, we tend to leave those problems later on for someone else to solve with what? Infrastructure. Take hospitals. W what are we doing at the moment? We're spending four billion extra on hospitals because we don't, we didn't, and we may not have the infrastructure to deal with another pandemic into the future. Look at, look at the uh, decarbonization crisis. Look at the biodiversity crisis. These are both examples of where the infrastructure that we've got oil and gas, is the wrong infrastructure. It worked great for, for 200 years till we realized, oh God, this stuff is not, it's not really for us. Um, and uh, until we realize that if we tend to do infrastructure badly, until we realize that infrastructure as it comes to us, as, as, as we receive it, and I'm thinking about the built environment, about yeah. cities, I'm thinking about the plumbing that we don't, don't see, I'm thinking about Starlink satellites, that Elon Musk is shooting up into space to yeah. connect a global internet that he will own. I, when we think, that's all infrastructure, but I'm also thinking about Unpost. I'm thinking about the fact that Unpost gave us each a postcard to send to our grannies for yeah. free, right? That's also infrastructure. And I mean it at all those scales. So we solve all of those problems, Mirren, when we think coherently about infrastructure. In Ireland, we think about infrastructure in terms of like land, right? Are you taking my land for your greenway? How about no, right? Um, our, uh, I want the government to fix that problem that's been there for, for so long. I don't want to pay for that, even though I will enjoy the benefits. These are the kind of questions that we don't generally have. And we, I'm, I think you solved that with, uh, it sounds trite, but it's really not. We don't have a program of what I would call civic engagement. And I, I, I mean, what I mean by that is, very often when uh, a local authority wants to build a bridge or they want to build a, a wind farm or they want yeah. to build something, they say, we're going to do a plan, there's going to be a consultation. Oh, look, the consultation's over and we're building it. And then people get annoyed and you know, it tends to be very difficult to do. It's very, very expensive and contentious. And eventually the bridge gets built and nobody can remember <laughs> why we built the bridge, why it's there or, 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 or any, any other reason. Despite the fact that interest rates have never been lower, yeah. It's never been cheaper to build anything. There are technology, the stack of technologies that we have to build any kind of infrastructure. Has, we have never been more powerful as, as, as humans, if you like, in terms of exerting our will upon the earth. And yet, uh, they can't build bus lanes in Dublin. They can't put, uh, they can't put, put trains in, in San Francisco. We can't do infrastructure because infrastructure is where the present meets the future. And very often, very few people speak for the present, but no one speaks for the future, except in Japan. In Japan, there's a fantastic, absolutely fantastic idea where they get city councillors and they give them special robes and they say, you are now the representatives from 2060. Yeah. Speak, tell us what you think. It's always the same. The representatives from 2060, they're more conservative when it comes to the climate that they will experience, and they're more radical when it comes to the, the, the kind of regulations and things like that that, that uh, will, will often stop 
uh, development in a particular area. I think if, if, if we want to solve these challenges, we have to understand infrastructure better, both at the personal level and at the national level. And we're not going to get there if we keep doing it the way we have been doing it, which is really it's about a transfer of power, a transfer of wealth, a transfer of, I don't know, just straight up cash to someone. Maybe two questions on that. Um, one, your own profession in economics has been in some ways a part of that reduction of mm. the discussion of capital sure. to something that just has a price on it mm. rather than a value. So we are living in Hayek's world. Of, and one, one, you can respond to that at one level. At a second level then, when you come back, and if you conceive of the future too in terms of the role of city-states and regions as much as countries, mm. We are about the size, if we look at it, if you look at, you rank up these global cities of Abidjan and Cote d'Ivoire. So we're in that hitting about the 5 million mark in this Republic of Ireland, obviously within a broader all-island economy. So if you take that and you say, we've got to expand a notion of capital, which involves much more around natural capital, participation, social capital and we've seen you know and we saw arguably we saw more discussion of that in March and earlier on in the year than we see now so we have to we have to take all of those movements and obviously there have been moves across the economics profession yeah. to broaden all of that but we have to do it within this very small in city state terms this uh, sovereign nation which sits on the UN Security Council, which has a Supreme Court and a head of the Supreme Court, and it has all the apparatus of a state. Mm. When we come back and we say, we want to change that system, we want to look at the allocation of our resources, and we're going to come out of this with a bigger government, a bigger G in the national accounts. Mm -hmm. And we want to say, we want to shape a different direction for that spending. How do we take those two things together, that wholesale change together with what's actually possible for us? Mm -hmm. At the same time, as you said, we've had a model which has worked really well for us and, and has worked even arguably better in the last seven years than it had even in the, yeah. you know, the 30 even before that. So bringing all of that together, what, what would you like to see us, and not even maybe one question, what would you like rather than the system to deliver to us, what would you like us to ask of the system? That's a great way to end that question. Okay, so, so many ways to go here. Start with the, start with the part where we don't value the right things. We don't value the right things because we don't know how to measure them. Economists, uh, it, it, it's very often, uh, it's very often, we're very often caricatured as sort of you know handmaidens of capital, you know, just just sort of the flunky in to give the in to give the powerful their words. It's not really what we do. Um, in fact, macroeconomics, which is my kind of base training, that's not what almost all economists do. Uh, we're just the ones who are yappy enough to get on the telly. Like that's that's really what it's about. Um, most economists study very small changes in um, social systems. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 m many of my colleagues in the University of Limerick will, they, they don't do the kind of economics that I do. And they don't really look at l the large scale stuff. What they look at is how can we make programs more efficient for individual people? And that's, that's really how, how, how they view things. Uh, the way I view things is policymakers need to make decisions based on numbers. And the numbers that they typically look at are jobs and gross domestic product, or if you're in Ireland, gross national income modified. Um, because, of, because of our very success. Yeah. Our very success at attracting all of the multinationals to Ireland has forced the actual measurement of our economy to be bent. And it's bent in a particular way uh, by, the, by their presence. So we've actually had to come up with another measure. In fact, 16 other measures, believe it or not, um, to do that. So that... It tells me that the CSO did that in nine months, they, and a very, very good job they did. We just need extra measures. One of the things I'm involved in is something called the, the Forum for Natural Capital. And what we're doing is we're trying to actually value 
the natural capital in four specific areas and see can we add those numbers into GDP. So for example, you, you go to one of these areas, you cut down a forest, GDP goes up because yeah. you've sold the trees. But of course, biodiversity goes down. So how do you value those two things uh, and trade them off against another? FDI goes up because you build a data center, but data centers huge, 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 huge amounts of power, and they also take lots of water from the system for their coolants. So again, you, you, you might trade off one against the other. The second part of your question, so, so metrics are the way that we, 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 we generalize the metrics and then we're able to make better decisions. And I actually genuinely believe our policymakers, by and large, do make decisions based on data most of the time. Uh, sometimes not. But today, too narrow a set. Too, today, today, too narrow a set. And, and very often um, presented in a particular uh, partial way by interest groups. And yeah. maybe before we leave that, does that prescription of more metrics, more data, are albeit on a broader base of. Is that the only measurement approach that economics can bring? Oh, no. Uh, so, so there's a new, uh, new approach call, which economists are calling thick data. It's not big data. It's, it's just the idea that, uh, and, and here, uh, uh, Michael McMahon, uh, uh, he's a professor of economics at Oxford, but he's one of the world leaders in this area. He also serves in the Fiscal Advisory Council. What, they, what, he, what he's doing is he's taking text from hundreds of thousands of interviews and he, he, he's pulling it together in, in, a, in a way that he can actually replicate the, the, uh, the emotions underneath yeah. what's, what's happening. And so that's coming in there as well. You know, uh, I, 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 just, I don't think individual numbers necessarily are what guide things. Um, economists pretty much love data and, and, and uh, I think we're far less ideologically... Um, bound than uh, we might often, not, not that there aren't right economists and left economists, yeah. of course, are, but uh, I think we're, we're, we're far less. But it, it's not generally my role to defend economists. Generally, um, I, I, I would be classed as... Well, I've just expert. decided you'll do it tonight. Well, that's fine. It's <laughs> fine. I can do the job. I can do the job anytime. But I find it fascinating. I, I tell you, I... I but so that, that was one part of Oh, of course. Answer. Sorry. We will please. have... I interrupted you. Not at all. Uh, we will have more. We will have different data. Yeah. Well, diff and the different, second part? Better data. And so, the, 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 <laughs> what was the second part of your question? Sorry. Um, I was in our size. Ah, yes. How do we... What, how do, what do we do? In uh, 1960, a guy called E.A.G. Robinson, who uh, was married to the far more famous and far better economist, Joan Robinson, he tried to define what small open economies were. And he said they're basically characterized by concentrations of uh, in sectors. They're characterized by highly homogenous ruling classes. They're, uh, they're most often, if anything, characterized by their deep dependence on international trade, um, and, which is obvious, right? Those, yeah. those are kind of obvious. The, the fourth one, which is kind of really interesting, is they're almost always, uh, they almost always have their success determined by the institutions that yeah. they're surrounded by. Now, Robinson, of course, was writing in 1960 as the UK was losing its empire, right? Yeah. So he, for him, the institutions that he was talking about were his own, okay? The so instruments in, of empire. The instruments of empire, in fairness. In fairness, that, that, is the, that is the context in which he was writing. But he's not wrong. And we've seen that more and more this year in terms of exactly. institutional... So, if you look where the state is, look where the state is powerful. Look where the state does what it's supposed to do, what it actually says on the tin. You find, and I, I gave the example of the IDA before... It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an agency with deep capabilities that's linked directly to a very, very, very strong government policy that hasn't changed in 70 years. It's, it's not unlikely that it'll continue to be successful in the next 10 years unless some structural change happens that we can't foresee. Look at our health system, right? Does it have a single mandate? Absolutely not. It has 10,000 mandates. Uh, and it, that's, that's, just a ne that's the necessity that healthcare and the health system brings. But it's much, much harder to imagine uh, a policy continuity with respect to healthcare uh, unless you have total policy uh, agreement amongst the general trend yeah. of that into the future. And that's precisely what we have. It's called Slauncher Care. Right? Now, you might argue how to get there, but it's there. Now look at housing. Totally different story. There are two, essentially two different models that are being proposed. One is, one is a model where essentially the private sector supplies the housing. The state pays a subvention for the people who can't afford it, and then the private sector keeps the stock of housing in reasonable shape. There's a, there's a huge problem with that in that it separates ownership 
what Marx would call uh, uh, um, uh, um, capital value from, from uh, use, which is use value, right? So there's this idea that you can live in the house, you can enjoy the house, you get the benefits of the house, but you don't own the house. Someone else owns the house. The, the other model is we build loads of houses for everyone and the state owns the house, uh, which bids down the price of the houses that everyone else owns. So there's a distributional question here. And price is a distributional variable. I keep yeah. telling my students this. You know, we, you know if, if we, 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 people think about price as a point. It's not. It's either you can pay it or you can't. Yeah. And the people who can't pay it are locked out of the main generation of wealth in our society. And that imposes an iniquity and an, uh, 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 which, which can be exploited. It also, explo it also proposes an iniquity which can be fixed like, this is not something, it's not, it's not a law of physics that there should be some people who can rent a house and some people who can buy them, right? You can't break the laws of physics. But you can put in a policy that says, actually, no, we choose not to do this. That means that all the people, the very quiet people, who are enjoying the value of their capital rising need to be okay with the value of that capital falling. And the banks to whom, that they, to whom they've lent need to be okay with the value of that asset falling. And I don't think we have any structure in our society to have that conversation. We, we, we do actually, and I, I tell a lie, it's called an election. Um, and we kind of did have a housing election yeah. the last time, but you know, it does feel like about 10,000 years ago since we had that. Um, how do you have that conversation absent the, the fire of, uh, of, of an election? Y you have it, I think primarily via the Commission on Taxation and Welfare, which the government has said it's going to set up. Um, that's where we get to examine the whole stack of, 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 of uh, spending. We, you know, we, tax, we tax capital gain, tax yeah. employer, um, um, entrepreneurial capital gains at 33%. Maybe it should be 23%. Maybe it should be 43%. But essentially, it's a bunch of nerds talking to each other. And that's that's fine. And nerds are they one forum. They should talk to each other. It's grand. We 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 we're, we're, we're a boring but happy lot. It's great. Um, where where I think it needs to be broader is a, a broader conversation about what is the state and what should it do, because as you very rightly said, at the end of next year, COVID will be a thing that is still happening, but it won't be the thing that disables large parts of our society. As long as enough of us takes the, as long as enough of us take the vaccine, uh, but we'll have a, very, a much larger public sector, yeah. and people want more of that. They want more childcare. They want more housing, and they're right. They they have every right to 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 um, to demand that of their politicians. The question is, of course, how do you pay for it? You can't pay for it using low interest debt forever. Yeah. That's that's not a model in it for, for a country that doesn't have its own currency, and we don't. Yeah. Um, Taxes need to rise. So on who? So I wrote a piece a while ago for the currency saying, your taxes need to rise. Uh, as, as you might imagine, uh, this was about, this wasn't, wasn't a very particularly popular post. Um, uh, people reacted to it and they said, absolutely, Stephen, we agree with you. They do need to pay more taxes. And I said, no, 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 no. You need, you, you, Murren, you need to pay more taxes um, because you'll get more services. And it brought out the most amazing conversation because people were angry, of course, you know, how very dare you, I, I spend so much and I pay so much tax and so forth. Everyone feels like they pay too much tax. You compare it to the Nordic countries that have the kind of services that we want, and the only group of people that pay Nordic levels of tax are the top 20% of all income earners. And they only pay that on their income. They don't pay anything like that on their wealth. You know? So we could see scope for wealth taxes, um, really serious wealth taxes, um, but increases on income tax. Yeah. For, for lower, lower decile workers, that's a hard, hard nut to crack. And in order to do that, you would have to raise the, the quality of the services that they receive, you know? But if you do that, you're much closer to a Nordic social democratic model, and that's uh, conducive to social cohesion. So your question was, how do we, as a group of five million people, get from here, where we kind of have a, a, a rapidly bifurcating society when it comes to ownership, to there, where more or less what your postcode, your air code, doesn't determine whether you go to college or not. Yeah. Right? How do you get to there? That's the goal. If you want to get to there, you have to have broad-based shared services, which are very high quality. you got to pay for that. It's very simple. But who's the you in that question? That's the absolutely vital question. And society needs to decide that. 
it can't just be, ah, the banks will pay, the multinationals will pay, you know, <laughs> the judges will pay, like it ha the, the lecturers will pay. It can't be that. It has to be all of us, and we have to decide. There is no forum in which we could decide those things. And an election is a terrible place to decide those things because it'll just be, I'll tax you the least, vote for me, please. You know, and that, that's what'll happen. And so again, it comes back to infrastructure. Do we have the infrastructure the in our society to have a really grown up, messy, complicated conversation? Because after I wrote that piece, people were saying, I'd love to pay more tax, comma, but it's really inefficient. And I, I don't really like paying for RTE. And I don't really like paying for, you know, uh, universities. And I really, really, really don't like paying for, uh, for the arts. Those people, never mind those people, right? I, I want to pay for uh, doctors and nurses and teachers. And that's it. And that's okay, but like they do come to work in a building, you know, and they, they, they enjoy all these things. But I do think if you, if, if, you, if you can have a conversation about what is taxed, who is taxed, how much everyone pays, and what they get for that, that's a really, really grown-up conversation, um, wherever you get to at the end of that. And I, no economist will ever tell you, ever, that this is the level of spending you need to have. It's not a thing, we don't do that. We just say, if this is where you wanna be, this is what you need to, this is the, the gas you need in the tank to go that far. Um, and we can be very helpful with that. But, but where we have to defer to political scientists and, 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 and experts in, 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 in community engagement is finding a way to have that conversation. We don't have it right now. And it's definitely not Twitter, <laughs> you know? So the national development plan that you're looking for is a new level of democratic pipelines. Yeah. In effect, to funnel I, that new conversation through. I, lo I would love people to be able to say, first off, I'd love people to, people to be asked. I'd love people to be asked, uh, what research do you want done? Like you pay a billion euros for your universities. What research do you want done? A lot of people will probably say, we want it for climate change. We want to understand how to uh, uh, reduce our emissions caused by, you know, uh, um, caused by agriculture. We want, we, we, we want to figure out, you know, uh, how to make better music, whatever it is. But we've never asked the public, what do you want us to research? I mean, I'm a researcher. 40% of my time is paid for, for research. And I just get to do whatever I want. Why doesn't the state tell me? Or at least say, we have a conversation. This is what we'd like. And I, I think um, it comes back to infrastructure. If we could build those things, um, yeah, if, if you build it, they will come. And that's <laughs> a very interesting film. topic for another day.